Hello, everyone, and welcome to 33 Principles in 33 Minutes, where you will learn about how to have the best board meetings ever. Um, in a minute, I will introduce you to our two speakers, but first some logistics. Um, as a participant, you will be on mute for the duration of the webinar, and if you have any questions, please use the chat box on your screen. We will answer all the questions at the very end of the presentation, and the presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Independent Sector website after, um, after we're done here today. Um, and since we are committed to sticking to our 33-minute timeline, let's get started. So your speakers today are Marie LeBlanc, a director here at Independent Sector who manages our Ethics and Accountability Program, as well as many other things. Um, and Dottie Schindlinger, a Governance Technology Evangelist at Board Effect. So now over to you, Marie and Dottie. Great. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, so I'm going to kick us off with just a brief overview of some work that independent sector has done on governance and ethics over the last 10 or so years. And our work is really grounded in a resource called the Principles for Good Governance and Ethical Practice which is a compilation of 33 different principles uh, that provide recommendations for organizations across the charitable sector to really live up to the highest standards of ethics and governance in their organizations. And this resource has been around for the last 10 years. It was created in 2007 in response to accusations of malfeasance in the charitable sector and out of some work that we were actually asked to do from um, Congress in order to provide a stronger set of self-regulations for the charitable sector at a moment when there was pressure to have more formal regulation. So the original resource was published in 2007. We published a revised version in 2015 that reflected some updated trends in the environment in which we operate now to about, about 10 years later. Um, but the original principles themselves were actually created in a very community-based way. We convened a panel on the nonprofit sector in the early 2000s and received input from thousands of organizations and leaders across the country on what types of recommendations should go back to Congress and be included in the final resource. And so what we have now are the set of 33 principles, which are organized into four different categories. Um, one of those, effective governance, will be the one we really dig into today. But the three other categories are legal compliance and public disclosure, which focuses on the rules, the laws that govern the charitable sector, um, as well as the need to balance privacy versus transparency and um, provide information to the public about the work that we're doing. The third section is on strong financial oversight, which focuses on financial controls, financial records, and the, the fourth is on responsible fundraising, which really looks at the ethical um, standards for organizations that solicit funds to do so in a responsible way. Um, and one other thing I wanted to note about the principles is that they're very explicitly called principles and not rules. And that's because um, they were really created to be as relevant as possible to a multitude of organizations across the charitable sector, recognizing that charities and foundations have different sizes, different scopes different um, histories, and it's important we felt that we're able to provide guidance that is responsive and flexible based on um, the, particular, the particulars of your organization, but that provide a standard of guidance um, that allows the entire charitable sector really to, to live up to a high standard of ethics. Um, and, and that we feel is really important because the charitable sector holds such a special, a special place in civil society and holds public trust in a way that many other sectors do not. And so being able to really have a set of standards that we feel um, help us maintain that public trust and, and really operate at a, at a high standard of ethics is, is really critical to, to what the principles tries to do. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dottie, who is going to help us understand what this looks like when we're talking about specifics of governance, like board meetings. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, by the way, we are going to send out a chat message to the entire audience just to make sure that everything is working correctly. We got a couple of messages from folks saying that they weren't able to, um, to hear the audio, and so we're trying to work through that to see if that's something that we can assist with. But um, So we will be working through that, but I, I do believe the audio is playing and the session is being recorded, and so we'll make sure that the recording gets out to folks in case there's any portion of today that you missed. Um, in the meantime, just a quick reminder as we go through the session, please, please, please send us your questions. You can do that, as you heard, through the chat box on the GoToWebinar control panel or through the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar control panel, um, and we'll be taking some questions towards the end of today. 
So um, just, just to kind of you know, piggyback off of the introduction to the 33 principles that we just went through, we're going to be focusing in on some of the specific ways that boards can adopt the principles, really zeroing in on practices that happen at board meetings. Um, obviously, some of the principles in Section 9 have to do with, um, sorry, not Section 9, um, yeah, Section 9 on effective governance has to do with um, you know, how often boards need to meet and some of the ins and outs of the size and composition of boards and some of the practices of boards. Um, and the principles are exceptionally good at making sure that you know exactly what is expected and how boards should operate. But sometimes that doesn't necessarily translate into, okay, so what should that actually look like? What would a best practice in a high-functioning meeting actually look like? So today, what we're going to do is dive a little bit deeper on best practices for really great board meetings. I'm going to call them the best board meeting ever. Um, we're going to take a little time to uh, review how that fits with the, the governance principles. Then we're going to talk about a, a checklist that you can use at your, hopefully, your very next board meeting to jazz it up a bit, make it a bit better, and make it um, a bit more in line with the spirit of the principles. And then finally, we're going to do some Q&A. We're going to do all of this in under 33 minutes. So <laughs> clock is ticking. We're going to move quickly, although I don't think I could talk much faster. <laughs> so, so I will try not to speed race through this thing, but uh, just really keep the number of topics we cover sort of tight. So um, first, I want to just take a moment and take a little bit of a step back and just have you think for a second of what, what really makes a great meeting? What, what is it that makes a meeting great? You know, I think those of us who have ever been in the role of planning any kind of a meeting, whether it's a board meeting or a conference or a committee meeting or even just a meeting of staff, um, often think about some of the same things. We might spend time thinking about, you know, what should the venue look like and um, how should the room be laid out and what sort of food should we serve and uh, what, what should the environment feel like and what technology do we need in the room to support the meeting and who's going to be the presenters, and what reports do we need to prepare in advance. We spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, kind of focused on the blocking and tackling and the logistics of a really great meeting. Um, but what I want to do is maybe kind of shake that up a little bit, because I think that maybe we, we invest a lot of energy and some things that probably don't matter as much, and maybe we spend a little too little energy investing in the things that mean a lot, that matter a lot to the outcome of the meeting. Um, so this picture that you're seeing on the screen is something that I want to share with you. This is a picture of a meeting that I attended about two and a half years ago um, that really kind of stands out in my memory as one of the greatest meetings I ever attended. And what you might notice in this picture are a couple of things. First of all, notice that we are in a really lousy space. Um, this was actually a basement under one of our favorite places to go eat lunch. Um, you know, it was not fancy by any stretch of the imagination. It looks like a basement. It was a basement. This was in the middle of January. There was almost no heat, which is why everybody is bundled up in their clothes, uh, wearing their, their full winter coats and everything else. Uh, there was nowhere to plug in the technology we brought. So basically, you can see that we've resorted to flip charts and pens and post-it notes. And we're all sort of huddled together, partly for warmth and partly because we couldn't actually see anything from one side of the room to the other because the lighting was so bad. And yet, look at everyone's faces. This was absolutely one of the greatest meetings we've ever attended. And the reason that I think this meeting was so good was because we knew exactly why we were there. We knew exactly what was at stake in the outcome of the meeting. Everyone understood their role. We had all prepared our minds to be there. And you might also notice we are all paying close attention. Um, now, every single one of us in this room has at least four digital devices with us. But there were times throughout the meeting where we said, okay, devices down, eyeballs up, we need to communicate with each other. So technology 100% supported this meeting in a really meaningful way. But when we had to work together, we put the technology down and we just paid attention to each other. And what came out of this meeting, this was a meeting of um, kind of a founding group of Board Effect, was basically the constitution that ran the Board Effect business for the next two years and allowed us to, to realize exponential growth and development. It was, it was a pivotal meeting. It actually became um, our product framework and our product roadmap for the next three years. It was really pretty exciting stuff. So what I want to do is just say, okay, let's talk about how we could implement some specific practices in our boardrooms that would help us reach that, that pinnacle of great meetingdom. 
you know, the kind of meeting like the one that I just showed you that we, any one of us would have gladly canceled our vacations in order to attend because it was so good, because it was so powerful and so much important stuff came out of it that we couldn't possibly imagine having missed it. And it was kind of life altering for all of us. We always go back to that moment in time and say, remember how we were able to accomplish that and try to live that same uh, ethos in other meetings that we've organized since then. And I think, you know, Nancy Axelrod, who, if you're not familiar with who she was, she was one of the, the founding members of uh, BoardSource, and she's a governance consultant, has been for many years, and is also just kind of a governance guru. Um, in her book, one of her recent books called Governing for Growth, she has this quote that I love because to me it encapsulates exactly what the role of the board is. Um, boards are really there to provide oversight. We all kind of understand that part of the board's role. We might think of that generally as the fiduciary obligations of the board. But really where the magic happens is when the board is able to provide insight, give us context, help us reframe issues, help us see things in a new way. You know, maybe the CEO comes to the board with an idea for a strategy and the board is able to kind of challenge that notion and provide back and reflect back different ways of slicing and dicing it to see it new. And that's incredibly valuable and can help to move the needle much, much further. And then when possible, and if possible, provide foresight, kind of see what's coming down the pike. The board has a very different perspective than staff. Staff is gonna be down in the trenches in the day-to-day -day slogging it out, but the board can kind of pick their head up from time to time and look out much broadly, much more broadly across the landscape to say, what are other organizations in our industry doing? What about organizations outside our industry that might be dealing with similar challenges? How do we tap into that at a board meeting? Um, what I'd like to share with you is actually a, a recipe that comes from a, a friend and a colleague of mine by the name of Susan Howlett. Um, if you're not familiar with her, she's a, a Seattle-based consultant, and she works in nonprofit governance in particular. She focuses on fundraising for uh, board leaders. So she works on a lot of fundraising uh, with boards. She has a great book that has my favorite title ever, ever called Boards on Fire, <laughs> Inspiring Leaders to Fundraise Joyfully, which I just think is a wonderful title. Um, but as part of this book and as part of her, her work, she came up with this idea for what does a great board meeting look like? And I'm kind of um, gonna riff on this a bit here and go a little bit deep because I think this is kind of brilliant. So first and foremost, uh, one of the things that I would say is really important, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a future episode about board composition, it is incredibly important to have the right people in the room. And by the right people, I mean a couple of things. First and foremost, I mean they represent a diversity of perspectives and opinions and context so that when you are working through an issue, you have a diversity of perspectives, context, and information to work from. The more diverse the board, and diversity means a lot of things to a lot of people, but I really mean you want people coming at the same issue from radically different positions and radically different directions because you will work harder and the final result, result will be better. It will be more nuanced, it'll be more thoughtful, and it'll probably have much more sustainability because you've already pre-considered some of the consequences you might not have realized if everyone in the room is kind of the same as everybody else in the room. So you want that, to, that group to have a diverse set of opinions and, and perspectives and outlooks. And then you also don't want the group to be so large that you can't get to some level of consensus. You know, consensus doesn't necessarily mean we all 100% agree with everything. What it means is that we agree to the point that we can tolerate the places that we disagree. <laughs> so that's really, you know, how you wanna get to consensus. So it needs to be not a gigantic group. Um, you know, I would say in, in some respects, there's some, some uh, philosophy around this, but I would say just from my own personal experience, my own opinion, you know, you kind of don't want more than, let's call it 15 to 20 people working together. And even that can seem kind of unwieldy. Ideally, when you're really digging deep, if you've got a smaller group, you know, seven, nine, even five people can be enough. Now, if it's too few, you might not have enough of a diversity of opinions to really move the issue forward in a thoughtful way. So there's definitely a balance and there's not going to be a magic answer across the board, but you just want to look at it from that perspective. And then the meeting itself should not be super long. You know, it doesn't have to be hours and hours and hours as long as you're meeting frequently enough that you're moving the business forward. This particular recipe is about 90 minutes long, which is about, you know, kind of the length of time that you can reasonably expect to hold people's attention wrapped uh, until they need a break. 
you know, at which point they really do need a break. And that break might need to be more than a couple of minutes. It might need to be a couple of days or even a couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, you might want to go, go deep at, for about 90 minutes and then break and then come back together either that same day or on another day. But here's the recipe. Um, if you'll take a look at the, the balance of time on the left-hand side here, the vast majority of the time, an hour of that time, is really spent on what I'm going to call governing, doing the work of governance. That means going into deep conversations, really thinking generatively, really pushing the needle forward. Um, you also want to make sure that you are leaving a lot of time for what I'm going to call board education. Board education can take many forms. It's not just, you know, what are your roles and responsibilities. It might be, you know, briefing them on a particular topic that relates to some strategy that they're working through. It could be a guest presenter that comes in and gives a talk to the board about something that they need to know more about. You know, maybe something like cyber risk or something like uh, what's happening out in the uh, competitive landscape. It could be an education um, on a topic that the board has kind of raised its hand and said, we don't know enough about this topic. We'd really like to be educated on this topic. And the governance committee comes up with a set of things that are going to be done at board meetings across the course of the year. So the, the, the vast majority of the meeting is going to be spent in really active, really thoughtful, productive work. Um, what you'll notice is there's not a ton of time on here for sitting passively listening to reports. That's intentional. We can read reports on our own time, us board members. We can be responsible for that. And then we can come armed with questions, armed with insights, armed with ideas to move things forward. If it is simply an FYI report, we don't really need to take up a ton of time on the meeting agenda to cover it. Um, now, there's a couple of nuances there, and I want to go into a couple of those. First, let's talk about the idea of starting with community building. So community building is one of those things that I think we don't often plan for. It just kind of happens um, kind of organically and we just sort of expect it to happen. But what's amazing is if we plan for it, if we make it intentional, it can be much more productive to the outcome of the meeting. And here's what I, what I mean by that. And, and Susan does a great job of talking about this on her book and on her website. You know, the importance of breaking bread together. You want to have some kind of activity that helps the board members get to know each other. Think about this for a moment. How well do you work as a team when you don't really know your other teammates? Um, you don't work very well with them. You, you work much better. You're much more, co much more cohesive once you know each other and can trust each other. So you want to have some kind of activity that helps to produce that trust, helps to produce that social bond. And it can be really simple. It could just be you make sure that there is food at every meeting and you intentionally take the first couple of minutes for everyone to talk to someone they don't know as well as someone else. Just go share one bit of information. It could be an icebreaker. It could be go find someone you haven't talked to recently and share, um, you know, share an activity that you did in the past week that uh, you have a good story to tell about. Share that story with that person. Just really simple stuff. It doesn't have to take a ton of time, a couple minutes, but it can make a huge difference. And then one of the things that I think is incredibly important that we often miss, and it sounds so so basic that I, you know, I feel bad even having to remind you about this, but please make sure people have name tags. <laughs> please make sure that they have name cards or name tags or some way for someone to identify their peers. Here's the thing. Look, those of us who serve on boards, and I am definitely talking about myself in this camp, you know, we have, we have day jobs. We are out there in the universe doing a thousand other things. We might only see the folks on our board a handful of times each year. And we just might not remember someone's name. We might remember their kids' names, their dogs' names. We might remember where they went to school, what they ate for dinner last Tuesday, and we just can't remember their name. And it's embarrassing. Um, and the thing is, we want to be able to know each other's names quickly because in between board meetings, if we want to connect with each other and ask a clarifying question about something we read on a committee report, we should have the freedom to do that. Um, you know, obviously within the bounds of what's allowed, we should be able to do that. So just make sure people are identified. Identify your officers. You know, that's another thing. I find a lot of new board members come in and it's almost like they're just expected to magically know who is who and who are the officers and what those officer roles are. Um, it can be really tough when you're new to really figure all that stuff out. You're probably just trying to keep up with all the acronyms you're hearing at, at board meetings. You know, it's like alphabet soup sometimes. And then for each board meeting, change the seating assignments. Don't let people sit in pre-assigned seats, move the name, the name tags around, move the name tents around, make people sit in different places so they can really get to know each other. 
and then maybe do a reintroduction at each meeting. This could be the icebreaker. This could be the social time. Everybody grab something to eat, sit at the table and say, okay, this, this time we're going to introduce ourselves again by talking about our first job or talking about our favorite meal or talking about the first time we volunteered for something. Come up with a list. Have the governance committee spin up a list and use that to really get to know each other again. And then the next thing that you do is you spend a minute or two, and it really only needs to be a minute or two, with something that reconnects everyone in the room back to the mission. And what's really helpful is if this comes from a board member or if it comes from uh, someone who's a stakeholder of the organization, you know, someone who receives and benefits from the services that you provide. It can be a personal story. It doesn't have to happen there in the room. It might be that you get the board members out of the boardroom every once in a while to go to an event or to you know, walk down to a section of the building and meet someone who works at the front desk and have them tell an amazing story. Just some way to reconnect people back to why they're in the room. Really, it should only take two minutes, but if this happens, you basically then get everybody's brains back on why they are there. And that can be so important to what's gonna happen next. Um, a really good way to do this is just have every director take a turn at each meeting and they have to um, speak for two minutes on something that has happened to them in the past that um, that they find you know really reconnected them back with the mission then the next thing i would absolutely recommend is use a consent agenda if you're not too familiar with how consent agendas work uh, very simply there's a couple of operating rules the first rule is that the board has to agree to read all the information in advance everything that goes on the consent agenda has to be completely non uh, disputable it has to be completely agreed to. If it doesn't have unanimous consent, it doesn't belong on the consent agenda. That's kind of the why, reason why it's called consent agenda. So there's nothing there that requires deliberation, but you do also have to make sure that board members are in fact reading things on time, because if there's something in a report that they wanna discuss, it needs to come off the consent agenda and get posted to the discussion items. So what I would recommend is this is a great use for uh, your technology. You know, post everything well enough in advance, make sure all the reports get in and done on time so that you can put them on the consent agenda. I'm a big fan of, you know, look, if you've got a, a, a portal that they're using to get all their board materials, post things as they're ready. Um, I know for the board that I serve on, our secretary posts the minutes five minutes after the board meeting ends because she's taking the minutes as she's there at the meeting. She just puts them up on the platform um, as soon as the meeting is done and they're already there and we can then read them right away while it's all fresh in our minds and say, you know what, this was wrong or my name is misspelled or this was actually the, the motion that you, you captured here was actually made by this other person. And that is super helpful because then when it comes time for us to approve the minutes as part of the consent agenda, we know we probably caught everything because we did it while everything was fresh in our minds. So try to get things up there when they're ready and then make sure that you're allowing a lot of time for the good stuff, which is the board education and the meaningful discussion. So a couple of things on those two topics. I talked about these a little bit briefly uh, at the beginning, but when it comes to board education, think about this like you're putting together almost an editorial calendar. You're thinking about all the meetings that you have for the year and you're planning out what are the things that we're going to be talking about. So if you look at this example over here, I've got, you know, so for Q, Q1, um, or Q4 of 2017, we're going to talk about strategic priorities for 2018. For Q1, we're going to be talking about the board education plan for the year. For Q2, we're going to talk about the strategic budget review. For Q3, we're going to talk about board and executive evaluations. And you could imagine if those are the themes for each one of the meetings, we could easily pair some board education topics around those. So think about it as a whole year. This is a great job for the governance committee to kind of put together this plan and then share all of this out. Again, use your technology. Get this in everybody's hands early, not just you know, when the meetings are, but what the focus of those meetings are gonna be. That's not to say that you don't focus on other things too. It's just, you know, this is giving you some time to plan and really think about this. And then in terms of doing the board education, the best way to get the board to learn is to make them present it. <laughs> I find this is a, such a successful strategy. If there's something that you know, someone always kind of looks a little, little lost when you're talking about something, ask them if they'd be willing to do a training on that topic at a future board meeting. I guarantee you they will become an expert on that topic. <laughs> so it's a really good way to get them to learn. If they're gonna teach it to other people, they're gonna dig deep and really make sure they understand. And they'll probably come scrambling to the staff for help. And that's great too, because then that means they connect back with the CEO, they might connect with other staff members, they get 
more uh, engaged in the organization, they really start to own that topic, um, that can be an incredibly successful strategy. Um, I would also then really recommend for those of you that are communicating with your boards, think about curating content for your board. If they're getting ready to talk about a strategy, find some articles out there, find some stuff that is relevant to that topic and put that into your board platform and encourage the board to read that stuff in advance of the meeting. Maybe even make discussion of an article one of the board education topics. That's an incredibly uh, easy thing to do and can be really good to get people thinking differently and talking differently. Then when we get to the bulk of the meeting, what we're really doing is governing. And what I mean by governing is the board's role, when you think about governing, really should be to ask the right questions. We don't need human beings to be the smartest things in the room. We have a bunch of technology at our disposal. We want to ask a question and get a quick answer on something. We don't need to play Trivial Pursuit. We can just look it up. What we need is the insight and the experience and the expertise of the people in the room to understand the right questions to ask, to understand what is the question to ask right now in this moment that is gonna change the way we think about this issue. So governing, really you wanna to try to find ways to help the board tap back into their purpose. Make sure they have a clarity of why they're there. Give them some starter questions, some generative questions. Um, there's a lot of them out there. There are the questions that typically start with the word why. There are questions that say, how do we connect back to our mission? And then you wanna make sure that you are integrating this into every single meeting. A really simple strategy is get some time um, on the beginning for discuss, get some time on the beginning of the agenda for discussion. Try to think about flipping the order of the agenda. I think we often leave discussion to the end. Try putting it at the beginning. There's no reason that the consent agenda can't come at the end. Of course it can. We can, we can pass the consent agenda whenever we want in the terms of the meeting. So let's put all the routine stuff at the end. Let's get people talking when they're fresh. Do your warm up, do your mission, go right into discussion. And then if you're not quite sure what people are, are thinking about, what's on their minds, try starting the meeting right after you do your warm up with a one minute essay. What a one minute essay is basically everybody's silent and you say, just take a moment and write down on a piece of paper a topic that you would like this board to cover in this meeting. Everyone takes a moment to write something down and then you have everyone read aloud what they wrote down. And as a group, the board can decide if there's a topic that they heard people say that they think, yeah, you know what? We do need to talk about that at this meeting. You have the freedom to add that to the discussion portion of the agenda. You can do that in the moment. Or as a group, you can decide, you know what? That's a very important topic but it's a big topic and it would be better if we do a little research and table that to a future meeting and then put that into the agenda for the next meeting. So that's a really um, helpful strategy to kind of get people in the right groove. And then I'm a huge believer in just doing occasional post-meeting satisfaction surveys. You don't have to go crazy. You don't have to do this after every single meeting. I mean, if you can, great. It doesn't have to be long, but here's a simple way to do this. Would you recommend this meeting to a friend or a colleague? That's a sort of a net promoter score. You could do it on a 10 point scale or you could just say yes or no. And then what do you think worked well and what do you wish we changed? Very simple, should take people five minutes to, five minutes to uh, fill out, but that can be incredibly helpful feedback to the chair, to the governance committee to try to make the next set of meetings better. We're gonna take some questions now. Um, so we have just a few minutes left. And so I'm gonna look at um, my colleagues here with the uh, independent sector to say if we've got some questions coming in. Yeah, thank you so much, Dottie. So our first question is, you know, you got into the weeds on how a good meeting should go, a lot of great tips, a lot of great um, pointers, but why is just the structure of the meeting so important to good governance? That's a great question. Yeah, so, so here's the thing, right? If we think about what really um, can prompt a board to behave differently, there really is no other instrument I can think of more powerful than the board meeting agenda. Because when you think about what you do as a board member, really you kind of think about being at a board meeting and, and going through the proceedings of a meeting and making decisions and hearing issues and providing input and you know, having insight. And so how you, how you construct the agenda will actually determine how well the board can and does operate. That, that meeting is really um, the moment in time where board behavior exists. Um, really, at its core. And so how you, struct, how you construct the agenda is going to help to dictate how well the board functions. So it's, it's kind of critically important, actually. 
Yeah, I um I would just echo Dottie what you shared there and you, you know we um unfortunately still do hear about you know instances where nonprofit boards haven't filled there or lived up to the responsibilities and duties that they have and oftentimes you know we hear about situations where the board wasn't educated properly or the board wasn't taking um, enough due diligence in understanding what was going on within the organization or really spending that kind of deliberative and forcing for foresight kind of um, types of discussions in board meetings and so when we think about as you said the meeting itself being that really the heart of what a board does and how they come together and make decisions and document those decisions um, having the right structure in place there ensures that the rest of the duties of the board are able to be fulfilled in a much more um, deliberative, thoughtful, and effective manner. And so even the work absolutely should be happening outside of the board meeting. Um, totally agree that, that that's really the place to not only push the board forward in a better direction, but to mitigate many of the challenges that we see boards come up against. I think that's exactly right. I totally agree with you there. And, you know, if they think about it, I'm, I'm really just thinking, you know, look, if if there are concerns or complaints coming from any quarter that the board is not upholding its its roles and responsibilities, you know, the, the truth is, it's the board's job to fix that. <laughs> it's not going to get fixed elsewhere. <laughs> so, so you got to kind of do it in meetings. And I think, you know, that's a really, there's a great generative topic to add to a meeting agenda. Uh, why isn't this board functioning well, people? <laughs> Let's discuss. <laughs> you know, so I think that's really well said. I think that's exactly right. You know, there there isn't some other magic space where this happens. It kind of has to happen at the board table. Great. Well, thank so, you um, so much, Adi, and thanks, Marie. Um, oh, there's. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Absolutely. So, so one one last thing I just wanted to do is we do have one little quick poll question that we'd like to ask people to participate in. This should give you uh, just, a, just a moment here. We're going to be doing um, more of these sessions. We're going to be going through some of the other principles that are part of the 33 principles. And so what we'd like to do is ask you to just take a moment and um, fill out this one question poll. And then at the very end of this session, you're going to see an evaluation form pop up. And we'd like you to also just take a couple of additional minutes and fill out that evaluation form. Since we do have, um, I think we're doing another three of these, or another two of these. Um, and then we also are going to be at the Independent Sector Conference again this year, and we're going to be doing another session there. We did a session on generative governance last year that was uh, really well attended. So we'd love to get your feedback and know how we can help you better. Um, we're open. We really want to know what you want, what you need from us. We're, we're delighted to provide it or try to. <laughs> so give us your thoughts and, uh, and we'd love to you know, do that for you. Um, the other thing I will mention is we are going to, we had a bunch more questions than we were able to answer here. And so we will also um, kind of write up a, a little bit of a blog post with some thoughts and some ideas about some of the questions that you've asked that we didn't get a chance to cover. And we'll put that out on the website along with the uh, information about this session as well. And then finally, as you heard us mention at the beginning, we will be sending out a follow-up that includes a link to the recording and the information from this webinar, and then also the links to register for the next couple in the series. If this is of interest to you or there's another topic you'd like to suggest maybe one of your other board members to attend, um, you know, we'll make sure to give you those links so that you can register. Anything else to cover before we end for the day? No, I think that's great. Thank you so much, and thanks for everyone who joined. Have a great day. Great. Thank you all so much. And uh, we hope this was a, a good session for you. And uh, keep an eye out for, for the survey coming in just a moment. And thanks again for your participation. And thank you so much to the team at Independent Sector for making this possible. Thanks so much, Daddy. All right. Hopefully we'll see everyone soon. Bye-bye.